Hello, my babies. Welcome to issue 70 and season 5 of Titular Characters. As usual, I am your lovely and adorable host, Eva Webb. And in this issue, we're featuring Katie Schenkel. Katie is a comic book writer best known for the critically acclaimed Eisner Award-nominated graphic novel, The Cardboard Kingdom, and its sequel. Her other kids' comics include My Slime is Live and Alice, Secret Agent in Wonderland. In 2020, Katie collaborated with Jody Troutman on the sci-fi comic 100 Light Years of Solitude, Midwest to her core. Katie lives in Chicago with her partner, Madison. And today, we're going to talk to her about comics. This is going to be fun. Hey, Katie. Welcome to the show. Hi. Thank you for having me. So uh, I understand you have a really fun new book out. It's uh, Cardboard Kingdom. Is that the one? Um, well, it's the sequel. So it's Cardboard Kingdom, Roar of the Beast. What's it about? So the first book, um, which was done in 2018 called The Cardboard Kingdom, was written by me and I believe 10 other writers uh, along with our artist. Um, And it's about a group of kids in the same neighborhood who one summer start creating costumes uh, and creating kind of alter egos for themselves. So some of them are, are heroes, some of them are villains some of them are monsters some of them are some of them are mad scientists there's a good there's a good range of of characters that these kids come up with and they use those characters to express themselves uh sometimes dealing with really tough situations but also sometimes just wanting to have a lot of fun and it was um really well received the I think the the book really connected with a lot of people um, and Random House, our publisher, was uh, very happy to have us do a second book. So the second book is the same, the same group of kids and the same creators that (laughs) created it. Um, And it's now set uh, about like a month and a half after the last book. So it's actually around Halloween and the kids are getting ready for Halloween, but there's some spooky stuff that's happening and one of the kids is also dealing with a lot of a lot of um, self-consciousness after he gets bullied. So mix that with people thinking that they're seeing an actual monster in the neighborhood at night. And there's this big mystery going on. So the kids try to rally together to, to solve the mystery of this, of this Halloween monster. That's pretty cool. Um, I love the, the dynamic uh, of of these books it's uh it's very like on the one hand you sort of see what's actually going on uh, but on the other you've got like what's going on in their imaginations and it's just mm-hmm. it's fun and it's silly and it's interesting uh it's it's a really um nice uh juxtaposition of everything you know that's uh, a lot of that has to do with Chad Self, who's the artist and also the person who came up with the concept. Um, and yeah, his artwork is just so good. He was, he got a really a fan base before this drawing, um, drawing RuPaul's drag race, drag Queens, like different seasons of them and doing like these really elaborate, beautiful posters of their different looks and making them look really like ethereal and really, like just really taking all of their costume designs to the next level. And I think that you can really see that in how he goes about some of the magical part, like the kind of imaginary play parts of the book. So um, what was uh, the collaboration like on this one? Um, Well, it was really interesting. The first book I, I've described it as a minor miracle that everything came together. Um, the The way that we all kind of came about was uh, Chad, along with one of our co writers, Jay, had written a short story called "The Sorceress Next Door," which had just been a short little mini comic that they had put online. Um, that if you've read the book, the first book is essentially the first chapter. Uh, he ended up redoing it for the 
for the full book, but it's the story of, of the boy and his sister and his neighbor kind of catching them playing and him kind of coming into his own, but then also the, the neighbor creating her own character in the night and then having, having this friendship where they, where they're also enemies in the, in their play. Um, And it was so cute and he really wanted, so Chad wanted to expand it. And so, but he didn't want to, this was what he had said too. He was like, I don't want to be the only person writing these because, you know, it was very personal for him to write the sorceress next door, but he didn't want it to just be from his own experiences. So he actually put out an open call uh, and sent it along online, basically saying, I want to make this book. I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't know exactly how we're going to publish it, but I want to create this project. And so if you're interested and you have a character idea, uh, post, like, send me, fill out this form, send me the basic, you know, elevator pitch of your idea. And I'll, and I'll talk to some the people that I'm most interested in and kind of figure out who I want to keep. And I think I found that I think actually Gail Simone had retweeted it. So thank you, Gail Simone for helping me with my comic career. I really appreciate that. She's amazing. No, I don't think, I think I, I, I've met her a few times, but I saw her at San Diego when we were actually, when the book was nominated for an Eisner and I told her that, and she did not remember retweeting it. So anytime (laughs) All you creators out there who are signal, or you know anybody who's signal boosting opportunities for other people, like you never know, you might actually be changing someone's life. So just so you know, um, but yeah, I had uh, I was actually reviewing comics at the time. I was working for uh, Comic Alliance and doing some stuff with the Mary Sue and a few other places. And so, but I had all, I wanted to write comics and I think most people who have wanted to write comics, but don't draw know that it's very hard to find artists who want, who will like want to look for writers. It's always writers yeah. looking for artists to draw their stuff. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's very, tr- that's one of the tricky things about like quote unquote getting into the industry is just like being able as a writer to get, samples and get stuff out so i was like you know let me just see let me like because it would be really cool if i got to work with someone who who were we're just gonna find a way to pitch it um and there was actually a so when i gone on to the site that chad had kind of written up explaining what he wanted to do and kind of the guidelines of this mission he had done different potential character designs and one of them is this little girl uh who is uh, who is black, who had like big natural hair and had on a monster mask, kind of like, it looked very Hulk-ish and had like actually big open Hulk hands. And I was just like, oh, I love that design. And I hadn't, I wasn't even thinking about, about writing towards that, but I'd written a, I had written a basic pitch of a girl who ends up trying to make herself more quiet because she thinks that's what will make people like that she'll be seen as like more accepted and and then she realizes that it's really like it's not making anybody like her more it's just making her seem like kind of quote unquote nice and like that she wasn't like connecting with anybody um it was a lot more about actually acceptance of her own like of people her own age at that point. Uh, So I sent it in. I think I only worked on it for like 30 minutes and I was just like, well, that's done. And I, so I got a response from Chad a a few weeks later saying, I'm interested. Can I call you? And we'll chat, we'll chat about it and talk it out. And, um, and so we had like a good hour long chat and, and we had come up with the idea that like, maybe not have it be about, you know, the kids at her class or whatever, but have it be like an adult, like a family member, someone like that, that's really like making her want to change who she is and kind of mute herself. Uh, But after we had just a really good conversation, you know, we're both from the Midwest, actually, uh, Chad lives in Chicago, but I was living in Indianapolis at that time. 
Uh, and now we're both in Chicago, but we haven't seen each other since the pandemic, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> but um, so I got, but I got off the phone with him and I went to my partner and I said, it went well. If I don't get this gig, I will be so bummed out because I just had a really good time discussing the story. If I don't get to write this story, I'll be so bummed. And especially because one of the things that Chad had said was, oh, did you notice that little girl who kind of had like the Hulk like costume on my sample? I was thinking about actually having her be the character that you had written. And I was just, oh my gosh, that's the character that I love the most from your designs. Like, I suddenly I was like, yes, I want that. I want her. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was, I was so giddy when I found out that it was part of the group. Um, and that was really the start of it. And then of course my first thought, because I'm, I can be a real pessimist sometimes it's like, well, now it's now, how will this all fall apart? Because there's so many of us. Um, we, but you know what? Chad is really good. He definitely, it was definitely a skill he had to work on as we went, but he's very good at kind of hurdling us and like, and like just making sure that like, that we're all doing the thing we're supposed to be doing. Um, he worked as basically an editor before we even got an editor through a publisher. And so our, the first book was more or less like roughly drawn by the time we sent it out to, to different publishers to see what they thought. There were a lot of edits that happened then after with, with a uh, random house, obviously. Uh, and they were all for the better. The, the editors at Random House have been really good about about knowing what needed to be kept in and also what needed to be fine tuned in a way that wasn't like that wasn't taking away from any of the things we wanted to say. Um, but yeah, it was I, I think it was easier too with the first book because we were basically cut all of the chapters, each of us each of us was assigned one of one or two or three of the chapters, depending on what we were doing. So it was really a, a bit of like puzzle pieces coming together. And we were all involved with each other's stories in terms of, especially one, because we were all interested and we would give each other notes if we thought, Oh, maybe you could do this and like just a little bit of a change. I'm also just a very editorial person myself. So I've, I've definitely dipped into some of the other chapters and been like, Ooh, but what if you did like just a little bit different? Um, but also because we were essentially borrowing each other's characters and like my Sophie, my main character was featured, like was introduced in the third. Yeah. The third chapter of the first book. And so I had a lot of people who were writing, using her in later chapters being like, okay, is this okay? It's the way we phrased it. Okay. And just kind of signing off. I, I don't think there were many actual like problems with that, but it was nice that we were all communicating and making sure that everybody was on board with what was happening with our particular character. Um, and yeah, it just, it came together really well and it was a pretty smooth like role I say that also because uh Chad had an agent at that time so Chad's agent handled all the the per book proposal stuff so like I say it went smoothly but that's only because I was like two steps away from it and I didn't have to I didn't have to worry about it until I got a message from him <laughs> but um but yeah it, it went really well and things like I said it was it really was a minor miracle that we had the right people who were committed, who were respectful of each other, who got along. We were all in like a private Facebook group and, and chatted and, and everything throughout the whole process. And it was, it just was a really good experience. So when the second, this is all preamble for the second book, but yeah. So when the second book was proposed and Chad wanted to do a Halloween story. He actually had a pretty specific general plot that he wanted to do, which was the fact that there was a plot at all really was very different from what the first book was. Cause the first book was way more anthology like. 
And this next one was way more of us all kind of melding our writing as we went. It wasn't necessarily that each chapter was just had one writer along with Chad. So it was a lot more of, it was a little bit messier, I guess, is what I would say. And it was a lot more of Chad, I think, really sticking hard to the plot and and then us kind of also coming in with what we think our characters would do within that plot, if that makes sense. Um, I, I think Chad was actually the one for, for the sequel to suggest to me that there'd be a team up with the Huntress and the Knight and the Big Banshee and that they form their own little, little team, which I loved. And I kind of built from there the idea of this new friendship between the Knight and Big Banshee and what that would look like. Um, and I was really passionate about that specifically uh, for the sequel because a lot of times in these kinds of books, like female friendships, there obviously there are tons of books for kids about female friendships, but but a lot of times it's just like a very small group of friends or, you know, for with a big cast like this, there were a lot of ways that that Sophie didn't necessarily directly interact with with all of the girls in the first book. And it was really special to me that um, that in the second book, she was able to develop this new friendship with one of the established characters and a character that is pretty different from her. And one of the things that I really loved about that was the idea that they both learn from each other and and they both grow in like specific ways. And the fact that like the last scene of them, the last scene that Sophie has in the book is a little scene of them together celebrating Halloween together. And I, and I really, yeah, I really, really treasured getting to write, getting to write those two. Um, And also it, you know, going back to Gail, I got to write a superhero team and make a reference to birds of prey and and considering Gail was the person who basically led me to Chad and his idea for this project, it was really special to me that I got to g- do a little nod to Birds of Prey in the second book. So, so one thing about this book that really stands out, I think, is you know the the cast is is multi ethnic, but in a way that is feels very very authentic. Um, do you have a thought on how to approach inclusion and representation in your work? Yeah. Um, so uh, disclosure, I'm a white woman. <laughs> I'm a white person. Uh, so I'm, I'm very, I'm always very careful when I'm writing because I do want to include lots of different kinds of kids when I'm writing different stories. Cause I do largely write kids books. Um, but, I, but I also don't want to overstep my boundaries or write, or write things, write characters in a way that would, instead of like making kids that are like them feel good and, and just joyful, feel, making them feel uncomfortable or just like, just off. I, that's, I think the, the biggest thing for me is just to to write with respect and to do my best to make sure that this book that I'm trying to write from a place of of empathy and of inclusion isn't actually pushing someone away, if that makes sense. Um, that was kind of my goal with Sophie, I, I, especially for the first book, because a lot of it has to do with her relationship with her grandmother and expectations of her as a young black girl specifically and how, and her, her loudness and her behavior. I did have uh, sensitivity readers who were kind enough to look over uh, the scripts and then also, also the final art just to give me a heads up in case there was something I was completely missing. Um, But, and in general, you know, the other, besides Cardboard Kingdom, I've also been writing, uh, for a publisher called Capstone, who does 
a really wide variety of different kids graphic novels. Uh, they do a lot of sports books, but they've also done kind of uh, twists on fairy tales and different like traditional tales. Like the uh, like the secret agent uh, Alice in Wonderland. That was yeah. fun. Yeah, the, I did a version of Alice in Wonderland where she is a kid secret agent a la Kim Possible and she joins the the uh, secret organization Wonderland. Um, and and so I was actually really proud of of um, Maddie, who is the Mad Hatter, who is a little black girl who loves making gadget based hats, which and her little her little sister, Dora, who is who was the Dormouse. Um, so, yeah, that, that was a good, like, joyful bit. And I just like. I can't, I can't take all the credit because the character designs on that were so good. <laughs> and I had a little bit of input on that, but obviously I'm not the artist. Um, but the nice thing about Capstone too, and this is something that in terms of inclusion, I'm very lucky to have worked with publishers who are actively not just accepting of me writing, um, writing kids of color as, as like either in the main cast or the actual main protagonist, but also they are looking for that. They are, they are actively encouraging me to, to include kids of color in these stories. And that has been really a godsend. It's also been really nice because for some of these books, I've been able to include, um, I've been able to include queer parents. So just having the story be about the kid, but they just happen to have two moms and the moms, you know, give them advice and are supportive, but it's not about them having two moms, even though I think those stories do have absolutely a place, but it's also nice just to have, have two lesbians be in a book (laughs) and and have them be regular parents. Yeah. That's, that's so important. Yeah. I, I really, when I'm writing, I'm really thinking about, is this going to bring a kid joy? Is this going to, is, is this going to potentially help a kid see themselves more in stories? That's, I think that's really the drive for me more than anything. Um, And again, I was very, the first Cardboard Kingdom, again, we, we started writing it in, in 2015 and it came out in 2018. So I had a long time to over worry that I was, that I was going to, that I was going to um, badly write a character. And again, like that, that my hope that little black girls will be able to connect with this character that, Oh no, what if I'm completely off, completely mm-hmm. off the road with it? Um, and luckily I've, I've gotten really good responses, um, from, from girls of color of all, of all, uh, ethnicities. Um, and it's been really, really wonderful to see, honestly, even with the characters that I didn't directly create in the book, it's just a joy to see kids of color see themselves, but also just, feel like they could be a part of this community mm-hmm. and they could, they could, they have a place in stories like this, which is so different from how, from how it's been traditionally in publishing, even, even a few years ago. I mean, the cardboard kingdom roar of the beast, every kid on the front cover of the book is a kid of color. And I, I think that is incredible. And I'm really proud to have my name be part of, be part of this book because of that. What is the appeal for you of uh, writing for children? The appeal, I think, is um, I was an avid reader as a kid. Specifically, I mean, I I didn't actually get into many comics. I got into comic strips and um, like all, all the volumes of like Calvin and Hobbes and Foxtrot and all those. Like I read those religiously. I didn't really have a comic shop near me. And we lived in, we lived in a very like car focused area of, of the United States. So it's not like I could just ride my bike to a comic shop. So I didn't really have that direct connection, but 
Um, but I was an avid reader of all types. Uh, the library was a very much a sanctuary, and my mom was very encouraging for me to, to go there and get books all the time. Um, and I think that there is some nostalgia for me for getting to write for kids in that way. I, I think there's also just so many opportunities to be really nuanced and thoughtful when you're writing with, for kids. And it's, and again, there are a lot of ways that there, there are a lot of messages that don't get to kids and it's, and it's nice to be able to kind of bring those lessons, the lessons of, I don't even want to say tolerance, but the, the lessons of empathy and respect for each other and, and the idea that people don't have to fit into certain boxes, which was a big thing for Cardboard Kingdom. Um, I, I, there's something really special about that. And I also, I also really love getting to write funny bits into, <laughs> into the books as well. Um, there, there is something really, really fun for writing for kids in general and just thinking like, Oh, this will make a kid laugh. Oh, for this sure. will, this, this bit will, this bit will, maybe that will stick with them. You know, do you have a favorite type of story um, to tell? Gosh, no, I, I like writing all sorts of stories. I definitely also just generally, like I want to write more adult comics and adult stories as well. But um, in terms of, you know, I really love writing for Sophie. That's something that I get a lot of joy out of in general. Um, and the format of the Cardboard Kingdom allows for some a lot of flexibility so that, excuse me, if I, um, if I want to add something into it, I can, I can talk to Chad and to our editors and like we can figure out a way to make, if I have like a really specific thing I want to include. Um, and she just such a fun character to write. She, I, it was very much, uh, a connection to me in my very loud, very talkative childhood. <laughs> um, so that in itself is like, it's just so much fun to, to get to write for. I also, in terms of other projects I've done in the past, my kind of twisted tales with capstone. So we had mentioned, um, Alice secret age of wonderland. I've also in the last year or so, um, the book, uh, the wolf in unicorns clothing came out, which is a take on the wolf in sheep's clothing. But instead of it being a wolf trying to eat, eat the, per the thing it's trying to be, um, it's about a young wolf named Daisy who wants to be friends with unicorns. And so she knits a, uh, a unicorn costume so she could sneak in and become friends with them. <laughs> and I, I love those kind of, those are just really fun stories to kind of play around with. Um, and they're super cute. It's also part of it was because I've, I've gotten back into knitting after like 20 years, <laughs> very recently. I think, um, it, yeah, I started in 29 mid, uh, winter 2019 getting back into it. And so now that's kind of my main non, non writing, non TV watching activity that I do, uh, that I do regularly. So this, it was just really an excuse for me to write about my hobby. <laughs> and it's such a cute little, little book. I, I think I described it as visually the cutest thing I've written. <laughs> it, it was, it was very sweet. So you have a lot going on in these stories, and I feel like every one of them that we've talked about, we've talked about um, Cardboard Kingdom, we've talked about the uh, the secret agent Alice. Um, you've got a couple of others, like, for example, Moonlighters and um, uh, A Thousand Light Years. And I was just wondering, um, where do you start with world building? Because you do a lot of that, and... Uh, is, is it a, a spark, like a single thing, or does it come fully formed? Um, it depends on what kind of project it is. For It's interesting because for Cardboard Kingdom, Chad had already kind of set up the, the basic prompt, <laughs> and, and then I kind of filled in the blanks for that. Um, for a lot of my capstone books, they will come to me, because it is a work for hire, so they'll come to me and they'll say, 
like for Alice, they, they said, you know, we, we would like you to write a, you know, a twist on one of these classic stories. We were thinking, I think there was like Peter Pan and Wizard of Oz were a few of the other ones, but they, but this editor who I'd worked with had said, I think that you'd be really good for Alice. So do you have any ideas? And they gave me a list of concepts that they hadn't used yet because they've, they've done quite a few in this series. So they want to try to like spread out the, the uh, tropiness of it. Um, and it just kind of, I did some thought, some searching for with Alice. Um, and I actually did a pretty large project in college. Cause I was an English major. I did a pretty large uh, project on Alice in Wonderland. So I got to use my, my degree uh, to, to really think about it. And, and then I, so they, again, they gave me kind of like a prompt and I, and I worked around it. Um, same thing with some of the sports books I've done for them. They'll usually say like, we need a book about like basketball. It can be about, we either want it to be girls or we want it to be co-ed, but you know, you, you have some, in terms of the plot, you have some flexibility for things like, um, for a hundred light years of solitude, which is a free mini com or not mini comic, but like short comic that I did with Jody Troutman. That was something that was been in the making actually for quite a few years. And we had talked about just developing something. We wanted to work together. And we, I think for that, it was actually originally an anthology pitch that, um, that we had sent out and got rejected and it was only like 10 pages at that point. And so we actually expanded it to 20 and just kind of built off that, off the concept that we came up with. Um, and then for, I'm trying to think what other stories I had. And then like, honestly, even for Moonlighters, I've been very lucky to that. Um, my editor for that JD Boucher uh, actually came to me and was like, we want to do a, a werewolf story <laughs> where they're in college. Can you help me figure out that story? Um, so I've, I've been, one of the nice things I should say about comics is the fact that it's so, so much of it is about teamwork and working together. So a lot of times I don't necessarily have to start from scratch with this, with an idea. Um, and so it's, it's very, it's much easier for me when someone gives me a little bit of a prompt and then I can kind of jump on that and kind of build it with them. Do you have a, a thought on paper versus digital yeah so cardboard kingdom i know is on kindle uh so but i don't think it's on comiXology which is i know very weird because amazon has comiXology and kindle i don't oh, i that's no weird idea. but i do i do know you can buy it on as an ebook on kindle um i am of the mind that i'm i am writing it as assuming that it's going to be it's going to be in print just generally um, in terms of, yeah, like page and, and um, the page layout. And, you know, if you're turning it and you want a little cliffhanger sort of thing, you know, page turner. Uh, but I am also of the mind that however you can get a story, as long as it's legal, you know, like get it through the library or get it on or buy it. But, but, you know, whatever format you can read it in, that's a good format for you. Um, I'm, so yeah, I mean, I, I tend to not worry too much about the guided view, especially because depending on what kind of, what kind of, um, system you're using, the guided view is going to be way different. So it's, it's kind of, it would be like shooting in the dark <laughs> if I, if I worry too much about that. But, um, but in terms of like, oh, should people only read on paper, like there's a kind of holier than thou ness to, to some people, not just in comics, but also just like in general, like, yeah. Oh, digital or like audio books. Well, that doesn't count. <laughs> and I'm, I'm very much of the, like, however you can read the story, you know, um, I actually would highly recommend that if, if you haven't been able to get to your library, a lot of libraries use Hoopla or another, um, another mobile app, where you can actually borrow the books as eBooks, just write like you don't have to go to the library at all. And that has been really helpful for me 
when I needed to actually reference something and I've been able to pull it up pretty quickly on through my library. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm very much a, however you can get it as long as it's, as long as you're not, you're not downloading it illegally. That's fine. Would you say that writing or, or the act of professionally writing a comic is different than you initially thought it might be? Oh, sure. Um, you never know what, what it's going to feel like until you really dive into it because it's such a different format than anything, anything that you've written in like in school or like I said, I have a creative writing degree. So a lot of it was just prose that I wrote, even the screenwriting class that I took. It's so, it's so different to write comics because in screenwriting you can, you can detail out all the little, all the little movements and, and how you want the scene to go. Um, but with comics, it really is like little photograph, like each panel is like a photograph. So you can't, you can't just say, Oh, they walked over here and, and assume that it will play out well on a panel. You kind of have to, you have to choose the best, the best like little photographic moments of what you're trying to get to. Um, which is why I think a lot of times, which is why like in scripts that you'll see writers just be like, and then you put a fight scene here. I don't want to, I don't know. It's just, (laughs) then they punch each other a few times, uh, (laughs) because they don't want to have to plot it out themselves. Um, so yeah, I think that one, that and I think one of the things you learn pretty quickly, or at least like the good writers do, is that to keep dialogue as concise as possible, I, it's very easy to, to spot a new comic writer, especially one that is written for other mediums, by how big their, their dialogue balloons are. <laughs> Um, and if they like take over the entire panel and you're like, why did you have a, an artist even draw this panel? It's taking up the whole thing. Um, I feel called out. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and then you get like someone like Chris Claremont who can do whatever. So yeah. it's like, there's always an exception to the rule, but in general, that's one of the things I always tell people is like, just trust me, get cut it down. I think I usually do like, maybe 35 words a, a panel at most if, if I'm having an, like real, like a lot of dialogue. Um, but yeah, just like for your own, for your artist's sake, for your letterer's sake, <laughs> that's always been, a- I think one, one of the things that has really helped me and it's been similar, actually, I've, I've started doing some game writing as well, uh, specifically for like mobile games, some narrative writing. And I think it really helps to after I've seen what my script looks like on the page or in the game, in this case, my brain kind of clicks a little bit more and suddenly it's like, Oh, I don't feel like I'm like I'm moving in the dark and just trying to get what I'm doing. Suddenly I can kind of, I can visualize what that, what my script is going to look like generally on a page and just getting to see that process go has made me more confident as a writer because then suddenly I'm like, oh, okay, this is, these were the parts that I could have cut back on. These are the parts I could have added to. Um, I, I feel like in general, I'm a very, like, I'm a mix of both words and visual learner. So having, having the chance to kind of just, again, just see what, what a page of my comic would look like has been, yeah, it, it helps so much, especially even now when I'm working with a new artist, um, like I'm, I'm working on a project with uh, Cassia Babas, who is, she's best known for uh, doing political comics for the nib. Um, and I think she has a first, second book coming out soon as well. But uh, the first time, excuse me, the first time she did a page of one of my scripts is like, oh, okay, now I know exactly I know exactly how we're going to vibe together. I know exactly how I'm going to write for her. And it made sense, you know? Um, 
Um, do you have a uh, a particular type of uh, panel configuration that, that you prefer, or does the artist sort of uh, take that over? Uh, usually the artist, I, I give the artist a lot of flexibility on that. Um, sometimes if I have like a really specific vision for what a page or a panel would look like, um, I'll let them know and I'll try to, I'll try to make that as clear as possible. But generally I trust the, I trust the artist to know how to, it will flow Again, it, unless there's like a specific thing where I was like, oh, it'd be really cool if this cut right to this in this sort of way. Um, you know, I might mention that just to give them some ideas. Uh, I think there was one, I, I had done a horror, a kid's horror book, very a la Goosebumps, about um, a, a giant slime monster. And I had actually referenced a, a specific Junji Ito page that I just really liked um, where it was like two or two people were being chased by a monster and the monster like comes right at the right at the page, like right towards the reader. And I was like, could we do something like like I would just really love that the way that that layout is and how like can we really like kind of pull and reference that and slightly steal it slash homage it. Um, so like it, for very specific things like that. I'll definitely, I'll definitely give them more direction for panel layout. But in general, I think artists like know what looks the best or even with them, um, if, if we are working with an editor too, I trust the editor to give adjustments if need be. I think there was, um, I think there was like one time where I realized that I think it was for the Alice book actually, when, when uh, it was when she was like growing and then shrinking. And I really, I realized that we needed an extra panel, like just kind of an inset panel. And I specifically asked for that just because I was like, Oh, we need like one more panel to show, to show like her taking, taking the suite that will, that will shrink her again, like in the book. Um, and so like occasionally I'll do that. Um but yeah, in, in general, it the nice thing about working in comics, at least for me, is that the collaboration element, I, I like to give I like to give a good amount of direction to my artists, but I also want to give them some flexibility and and not like just be directing them to do everything. Cause again, that's something that I think new comic writers often do and you don't realize that it's more of like a dance. Than, than you telling them, like, instructions on a map, you know? So how do your characters find their voices? Um, that's through magic, and I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I I mean, how it's it's like, how do you get your inspiration? I don't know. They just come, and I, I'm very grateful when they do. Um, yeah, it, it really is just it's hard to, it's hard to kind of put into words or to describe because I think I'm just very lucky when I find, when I find that bit and I hold on to it. Um, and it's very much what other writers say where it's like, Oh, the character f like moves me into the story or, you know, mm -hmm. um, a lot of writers say stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. And I hate to be a cliche, but it is kind of true. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of times it really is just, it really is just kind of playing with the characters. Um, the nice thing I think actually, again, with comics is there are times when I get very rigid in my writing and the artist actually loosens it up a lot more and like the character just seems more relaxed and like it makes more sense or like their facial expression isn't how I imagine it to be, but I'm like, oh, but that actually connects pretty well and and suddenly that actually drives more of the characterization when I'm writing that character down the line. Um, I, I feel like Moonlighters was a big, yeah, Moonlighters was a big one for that just because um, Cal Moray, who is fantastic, and I and I really hope to work with them again. Um, but yeah, made like certain really distinct choices in terms of just how like the tone of of the dialogue changes with their, the facial reactions that they drew. And that did inspire, or at least like adjust how I saw the character itself. 
again, I, th I think that one of the great things about, about comics is the fact that the artist and the writer really do have, I guess, license with the character. There, there is so much storytelling that happens within the art that can elevate the script in a way that I think a lot of times I get credit for. <laughs> um, there are definitely some bits where they're like, oh yeah, that was so inspired. And I was like, yeah, that was my artist that came up with that bit, but I'll take it. I'll take the compliment. <laughs> That's awesome. So are you ready for uh, the active fan questions? These are fun. I will do my best. Awesome. Do you have a favorite single issue story or title of all time? God, I'm I'm really bad about choosing like my number one ever. This is not just with comics. This is just in life. If they mm -hmm. were like, you know, if there was one desert Island, like CD or something, I'm like, I don't know. I want, I like variety. I don't know. <laughs> um, so this is very hard for me. Um, I really, I will say one of the books, this is kind of a cop out because it's not necessarily like all, all time, but one of the books that really got me into reading comics when when I was getting into my 20s and was trying to actually like actively read comics was a kid's series called Little Gotham. Really? Um, yeah, that was uh, by, it was drawn by Dustin Nguyen and I forget who the writer was, which is usually, it's usually the opposite where no one remembers the artist. Um, but it was, it was such a charming little book and it, it had such a great style to it. Dustin's so sweet. I, I got into chat with him a little bit. And, um, and I was also like very in, I was on Tumblr a lot at that point. Um, so I was very, like, I was very enthusiastic about it on Tumblr. And it, it's also somewhat of a cop out to choose because in the um, Comic Con issue that I think they, they actually like gave out at Comic Con, um, Dustin had drawn in different fans that he knew of and he actually drew me into one of the crowd scenes as a as a nightwing cosplayer and oh wow i did not know this yeah yeah i was actually in a panel with batman like i i was behind batman as he was talking which is still like and the funny thing is is that i think i had i think i had dm'd dustin about something um i forget what it was it i think it was something to do with the book and because he was just very, like, he was very open and casual. But he had mentioned, oh, yeah, thanks. And he was like, oh, by the way, I don't know if you saw if you saw the the issue from, like, a few months ago, but I drew you into it. <laughs> and I was like, excuse me, what? Wow. <laughs> and, yeah, and I was like, no, I haven't seen that. Um, so, so you officially it, exist like, oh, my. within the DC universe in canon. Yeah, yeah. Wow. That's weird. It's so weird. And this was well before I was writing comics too. So like my, my life is very strange. I'm like, I've got nominated for an Eisner now. I'm technically in a world where Batman exists. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm friends with like a lot of really cool comic writers who have written some of my favorite characters, which is bizarre, like actively bizarre. Um, but it was such a great, that was such a great comic series. It was so, it was so beautifully done. It was so poised to be great for kids to read and and it really did dive into a lot of the bat family like it goes really deep it doesn't just do the regular cast of characters they do a bunch of like the side characters and it's all about different holidays and different like times of the year so there were a lot of really fun bits and pieces that uh that ended up just being really delightful um and oracle is actually in it and this was before this was while the new 52 was going on and like, and they were dead set on not having Oracle in, in the main continuity. <laughs> so it was, it was really cool to get to see or like Barbara, who's my favorite character ever uh, be Oracle in like this one version of the, of the DC universe again. That is So that's cool. like, I think that, that that's going to be my choice, even though, like I said, it's kind of an asterisk because there's so many others I could probably I could probably grab. That's too. a great choice, though. Okay, so when was the last time a comic book made you cry? <sighs> um, 
So I'm going to do two. One that's Mm -hmm. actually from a few years ago because I remember actively sobbing. And then there's going to be one that's a little bit closer that I don't remember. I remember being really emotional about, and I can't remember if I actually cried. (laughs) Um, the first, so the one where I actively cried was actually at the end of the school girl graphic novel, um, where one of her best friends gets like mortally wounded. And I was, I was very emotional. Uh, and it was just, I, I love that series. That would definitely be another one of those on the list of potentially my favorite comic series of all time, like Erica Henderson and, uh, Derek Charm and, um, and Ryan North just made such a beautiful book. Um, and the graphic novel is a really fun kind of one shot sort of story that again, gets very emotional at the end. And I think both times, both times I read it all the way through, I cried at the same part. So yeah, that was intense. And then the, uh, so the, the one that's more recent was uh, Superman uh, versus or Superman smashes the clan, which came out last year. And that was a good one. uh, So good. Um, And I was excited about it as soon as I heard about it and it was done so perfectly. Um, I don't do much. I don't know much comic criticism nowadays, but I did, I contributed to a polygon end of the year list uh, for last year. And it, that was one of my, one of my choices for it because it's so, one, because it's the historical context of the actual story and the fact that this was a, that the, it's an adaptation of the radio program that was played during that same time that actually helped, helped change the narrative of, in the U.S. of the Klan as horrible, you know, evil people, like, the fact that we got to see it in a new light and during this time when, when gosh, I mean, even before the pandemic, but definitely during the pandemic where, where people are being, are being targeted so terribly. And there are, there's so much, the white supremacy that is seep that I would say seeping as if it's just started, but you know what I mean? Um, There's, it's so relevant to today, but but the historical context of it in terms of how it actually changed people's minds at the time it was originally told, as well as I, I think what moved me the most, honestly, was the fact that there was a lot of back matter in the graphic novel that goes into detail about the, about the historical um, mistreatment of Asian Americans throughout, throughout time. Uh, there's there's just some really good resources, and I thought that that was beautifully done for a book that kids are going to get their hands on. Mm-hmm. So, again, I don't remember if I actively cried, but I, it definitely moved me. And I and yeah, so that would be my like kind of second choice. That's awesome. Do you still have time to read comics? I I definitely have time. I think it's been hard because of everything in the last year. I, there are definitely books that I've been meaning to, to pick up and read. Um, so yeah, it, it's not so much the time; it's more of it to use to use uh, the chronically ill term. Uh, whether I have the spoons. No, nah, I, I get you there. The yeah, um, I am trying to. I'm, I am trying to get into more reading in general because it is it is something that. Again, a lot of comic writers advise people who want to get into comics. It's like you should be reading comics. You should be not mm-hmm. just with comics. Also, you should be reading like uh, nonfiction and prose, and you know, just in general, be like well read. And um, and I would totally agree. And I'm just very bad at taking my own advice sometimes. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I still have some books from from um, C2E2, which happened right before everything shut down, that I should really actually pick up and open and, and read. So if anything, this, this podcast should hold me accountable for that. Awesome. Well, Katie, it looks like we're, uh, we're up against the end of the show. Are you ready for the fun part? Sure. All right, let's start with an easy one. What's your favorite food? Um... 
chicken soup specifically mm. uh, my mom's recipe my mom makes a re- made a really good chicken soup and i've been able to to recreate it it's like like long term like several hours full chicken cooking it down very like really good broth nice yeah that is hard with family recipes sometimes yeah i feel pretty good about about it and it's definitely something that we have a giant oh like a big old soup pot and we use that for like chili and for chicken soup mostly awesome so would you say you're a uh, a cat person or a dog person so here's my bit of shame i'm writing a book about cats <laughs> But I'm a dog person. <laughs> and if and if and when, when, knock on wood, uh, the book comes out, um, I know people are going to be like, oh, so do you have cats? I'm like, well, my artist has cats, and I think that should count. It should. Um, but I'm a, I am I grew up with dogs. Um, I don't know what to do with cats. But if, if I'm near cats, I don't mind petting them. I just need to make sure I take allergy meds beforehand because uh, dander always makes my my face get all gross. Same. Yeah, I know how that, and I know exactly how that one goes. <laughs> okay, so are you the type of person that would adopt an unusual animal and give it a royal title? Oh, I would be worried that I wouldn't be able to care for it correctly. Um, so probably not. Hmm. But that said, I have always wanted to to be able to meet interesting animals. I know that um, one of the zoos in Chicago was doing, before the pandemic was doing a thing where you can meet some of their otters. And I've been, I was really tempted to do it because I was like, I want to, I want to hug an otter. I want to hang, I want to high five an otter. They are. They're so cute. I don't know if I would want to be responsible for an exotic animal. (laughs) Right there with you. What is uh, the most expressive use of profanity that you, you've ever seen? Oh, gosh, I don't know. I, I'm pretty, for a, a, child, a children's author, I'm pretty, <laughs> I swear a lot. Uh, but luckily, I don't live with children, so it's fine. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if there's any, if there's any one, one time... Um, I don't know my my dad, who is a very sweet and usually gentle man. If if um if uh, the Ohio Buckeyes are playing badly, that I've I've heard some stuff. Nice, <laughs> I, maybe I can't. I don't know if I can if I can quote it. But oh, you absolutely but, can uh, if you want to. If you're comfortable. No, I mean I I don't know if I can quote it because I can't remember exactly it. He it's been. But you know, it's in general. I think that that's probably the. I've heard some some uh, creative aspects to that. Nice. Okay, now a question you said you wouldn't be able to answer uh, earlier, but I will ask you anyway. What inspires you? I hate to be like, oh, it just comes to me, but a lot of times it's it's not so much the inspiration. It's more like knowing when I should write something down because sure. I'll have ideas fairly regularly, but, but having the confidence to be like, no, I should write that down and, and think and try to really build off of that, that I think I get held up on. If that makes sense. It totally um, does. Yeah. I, again, is that a cop out question? Maybe, but, but I feel like the inspiration is never the problem. It's always what comes next and, and having the, having the wherewithal to go, right, you're not a terrible writer, you can do this, don't, you know, let let it meld and let yourself kind of figure it out as you go and not and not uh, throw it away right away. I think that's, that's the struggle for me more than when inspiration hits. Absolutely. Where do you find joy? Not on the news. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've had to be very good. Actually, since November, it's been easier for me to watch the news. But before that, I was like, absolutely not. I couldn't. Um, I find joy, I think, in my partner. 
who I love very much and who, especially in the last year, we've seen a lot more of each other. Um, I, I find a lot of joy in our in our relationship and how we we work together. I find a lot of joy in terms of my career. I find a lot of joy in getting to see the responses of of readers, both kids. I mean, obviously they're the the prime the prime demographic for me, and I love seeing kids who connect really well with the characters. Um, actually, a friend of mine uh, had a, has a daughter who for the first few years that I knew her, um, who like, I think I've met her when she was around four or five and she just did not talk to me. I'd be like, hi, and would not talk. And then uh, Cardboard Kingdom came out and she suddenly was real, she really loved Sophie. <laughs> and so suddenly she thought it was cool and she would talk to me. And I was like, if anything, if nothing else, this, the book produced this. So I'm that bring that brought me a lot of joy. But um, it also, it also really is lovely when I have adults who connect with the book and say this is the kind of book that they needed as a kid because one of the things that we've always said among the Cardboard Kingdom team is the stories that we've written are the stories we wish we had as kids. We, they were the ones that, we, that would have helped us feel less alone. And the fact that we get to... I, I'm very bad about internalizing the compliments in general. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's always, it's always so hard for me to just like to let myself have them. But, but I've been really trying hard to let myself embrace the fact that the, some of the, at least some of the things I've written have helped people's lives be actively better. That. I don't know. I don't take that for granted. And that brings me a lot of joy. And I really do. I really do. As much as conventions drive me crazy and they totally, they totally, totally wipe me out emotionally. Um, there is something really beautiful about having the, the, not only to see new readers who immediately gravitate towards books I've written, but also the ones who are coming up and talking about, how much it meant to them and li librarians and teachers talking about, I mean, there have been, I, I've heard from parents who have said my son did not like to read books. And then he picked up cardboard kingdom. And that means, I mean, it just, I don't know if it gets better than that. It like, that's, that brings me a lot of joy. So yeah, that's, those are my answers for that. <laughs> You're uh, living in a different universe, not the one where you coexist with Batman, but the one where you coexist with uh, Captain America and the Avengers. And it just so happens that on this particular day, he happened to be fighting Thanos. He's got the Infinity Gauntlet. Um, you're losing. Bad. It's, it's really just terrible. Um, but he's got the Infinity Gauntlet, and uh, he's going to snap his fingers and wipe out half of all life in reality but the minute he's about to do that before he can get those fingers to close he dies of a heart attack which puts you uh in immediate control of the infinity gauntlet you now have the ability to mold or shape reality in any way you see fit what's the first thing you do with it first i take a nap <laughs> and i'd I just ask everybody to just calm down and not disturb me because this is not something I would, I would uh, choose right after almost dying. Of course. Um, oh gosh, that's so, that's so tricky. Especially because if you're in the Marvel universe and anytime you have good intentions, they're always going to turn bad. Mm -hmm. Like that's just, that's just the rule. Um, yeah, I, at the very least, I would I would store it away and take a nap and let myself think about it and not be too hasty. Um, and I don't know the context of the universe outside of <laughs> if we're talking about like Endgame or just generally if Thanos was doing some some bad shit. Um, it could be either one. Okay. Um, yeah, I would. 
I don't know. I'd probably get rid of the Republican Party. There you go. <laughs> I think maybe, yeah, like I would, I would, um, yeah, that's, I think this would be my answer is that I would get rid of the two-party system and create a multi-party system. I like it. And and have that, be, have that be systemically like stable within the American government. And I feel like if that's the only thing I do with it, I, I think I've done it. I think I, I'd be okay with that. I think I think that's a worthy answer. Goodness knows, goodness knows if we were in this in this universe. <laughs> um, but yeah. So what is next for Katie Schenkel? Well, um, in terms of things I can talk about, <laughs> um, so I have a romance uh, a romance mobile app game that I've been writing. Uh, this is very not safe for children, not safe for work but it's through the maybe interactive app and it's a story called tools of engagement. It's actually an adaptation of a romance novel of the same name, but I'm adding a lot of different choices. It's very much a choose your own adventure type type game. Um, So the first three episodes are up now. And if you want to uh, be romanced by a, by a very smooth cowboy Yay. Um, I would. Heart I'll try it out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. And, yeah, please do. Um, and so, and then in August, I have another kind of spooky Goosebumps-esque graphic novel coming out uh, called Night of the Undead Frogs about a bully who tries to play a prank at night on his science teacher by messing up the, uh, the dissection projects and... He discovers that, um, yeah, that something has gone awry. And I'll leave leave you to that in the title. Um, And then I'm trying to think if there's anything else I can talk about. Like I said, I'm I'm working on some some other book projects behind the scenes. Uh, And in general, uh, if you haven't gotten my, my other books, you can check out my other books as well. Well, Katie, I just wanted to thank you for making the time to pop up on my uh, my humble little podcast. Thank you for having me. I I love talking about craft and and kind of my point of view on that. So when when you were describing your podcast to me, I was like, yes, nice. yes, this is definitely up my alley. So So where can people find you online? Uh, you can find me way too often on Twitter. <laughs> At, uh, at my, it's at just plain tweets. Um, I am on Instagram. I mostly post knitting pictures and selfies and occasionally book promotion at katie.shankle. Uh, besides that, uh, you can check out my website, which has uh, all my different books and ways uh, ways to follow me there, uh, katieshankle.com. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Oh, and also I do I do run or co-run uh, the Cardboard Kingdom Twitter account where you can find out all the information about the book. It's at the Cardboard K. And now it's time to close the show. Imagine it. The lights beginning to come on in an empty theater. People starting to get up from their seats. The smell of popcorn crushed on the floor. And the thought runs through your head that titular characters is awesome and you want to support it. Fear not, my friends. There are tons of ways to do it. You can follow Eva at Eva is Adorable on Twitter. You can leave a review on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, CastBox, or Podcast Addict. And if you're feeling super generous, you can leave some dough at buymeacoffee.com slash Eva is Adorable. There, you can contribute as little as a dollar. And every bit goes towards paying for production and hosting of this show. How cool is that? Titular Characters is a show about the things we love. It is produced and hosted by the adorable Eva Webb. Opening theme by Antonia Marquis. Closing theme by Mikey Flash of Speed Force Music. The dreamy announcer guy who reads the credits is Donnie Underwood. That's me. Join us next time for another death-defying adventure in cyberspace. See you then.